Hello! Today I'm going to talk about the history of PFAS compounds. PFAS, of course, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. And we're going to go all the way from the beginning of these fluorinated compounds to where we are today, just talking about things like invention and production and manufacturing, not so much about human health effects. We'll cover that in a different episode. So, PFAS. A brief history. I'm saying refrigerators to the Manhattan Project to couches and cookware. That is a diverse class of compounds, as you can already see. So the first thing to look at is a rock. This is a mineral actually called fluorite. The commercial name is fluorspar. Uh, this can contain up to 98, 99% of calcium fluoride. And this is the world's biggest source of fluoride. So when you, when you look at any fluorinated compound, this is where it initially comes from, is from fluorite. It's very pretty too. It comes in lots of different colors, um, mostly mined in China, but South Africa, other parts of the world also mine uh, fluorite. In 1771 is where we'll start this little historical journey. Uh, Dr. Carl Scheele discovered HF. Back then, they were first discovering elements and atoms, and the, the science wasn't anything like it was today. Um, but he used that fluorite that I just showed um, to form HF, uh, an acid that, as he found, burned your hands pretty well. Um, he actually died in his early 40s because of exposure to lots of different things he discovered, such as mercury. Um, so thank you, Carl. You started out this whole journey. Um, skipping ahead to 1851, Dr. John Gorey uh, first patented the ice machine. He was a physician uh, and wanted to practice his medicine in the tropics where they needed ice to treat things like malaria. But how do you get ice in the tropics? So he invented this ice machine. Didn't really know how to do the refrigerant, but it had a compressor um, and an expansion chamber, similar to how modern refrigerators work. Um, but he envisioned things like ammonia, um, to be used and not, not fluorochemicals yet in 1851. So this is a picture of what his little refrigerator looked like. It's pretty funny. It's a wooden frame, uh, with bricks and it's got a compressor. It's meant to be driven steam powered. Um, this is great. 1851, very, very steampunk in those days. Let me fast forward again. We're jumping just decades ahead. 1921, this guy whose nickname was Boss, Boss Kettering at GM, and this other guy, Midgley, they worked on tetraethyl lead. Um, we all know what happened with tetraethyl lead in gasoline. It was added for anti-knocking. These guys said it was the, 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 neck, the best thing since sliced bread, but it turns out it had huge environmental impacts. There was a cover-up. Great story just about tetraethyl lead. But these two fellas, um, especially Thomas Midgley, one of the tetraethyl lead guys at GM, uh, was working on refrigerants because they wanted to put air conditioners in cars. And using things like ammonia and other things that are hazardous is not a good idea in a car because you could be exposed. They invented this dichlorodifluoromethane. Um, this is one of the first CS CFCs that you would think about in refrigerants. Um, and then this was just a breakthrough in refrigerants because relative to some of the other gases they were using, it's relatively safe. They even, I found a, a story, a guinea pig was placed under a bell jar with the CCL2F2 and instead of gasping and dying, the animal is not even irritated. So they used a literal guinea pig to prove that this was safe back in the 20s. And now we move ahead. So 1938, remember, so we've got, we've got fluorocarbons, we've got the ability to synthesize these chemicals. And um, some guys, this Roy Plunkett guy was working at Kinetic Chemicals. Now Kinetic Chemicals was a collaboration between GM and DuPont. And they were looking to make some other types of refrigerants. And when he was working with, uh, I think it was tetrafluoromethane, uh, trying to do some reactions to make other compounds, he accidentally made a polymer out of it by making the conditions just right in his storage containers and got this white substance. Um, so he knew right away that he had made a polymer, but it was years until they kind of figured out what this polymer was, what it could do, um, and its properties. So this is the guy who is credited with uh, actually discovering PTFE, which now we know is, is in Teflon. 
1939 to 1946, we all know what was going on at this time. This was, this was World War II years. And when you look at history of anything in these years, World War II is gonna come up. And of course, the Manhattan Project in the US um, was the just forefront of chemistry of the days. And when they were purifying this uranium, they had to use some very, very toxic gases and it was dissolving their containers. They found this, this new polymer that was created by DuPont. DuPont was also involved in the Manhattan Project. Um, they found their new polymer, it was so inert, they were able to make some of the containers, some of the reaction containers for uranium out of that PTFE. So that was a fantastic first use that really proved the utility is the, of these as industrial chemicals. So DuPont, of course, you know, they, they saw a potential for a commercial product here. So they applied in 1944 for a trademark for Teflon. So Teflon would be initially based on that PTFE, but Teflon could actually be based on a lot of fluoros. It was based on PFA and FEP, lots of other fluoropolymers. Teflon is just the brand name. And while all this was going on, we, we saw DuPont being at the forefront of developing these fluorochemicals, but 3M was also working on it um, in collaboration with this guy, Joseph Simons. So Joseph Simons at Penn State University was the first to discover electrofluorination. And electrofluorination, compared to how these things were synthesized before then, um, it was very fast and clean. It was a pretty expensive way to synthesize things. Um, but 3M picked it up, and they actually acquired the patent from this guy, Joe Simons. They call this the Simons method, the uh, electrofluorination. And I, I like that name. I, I approve of that name. 1946, 3M began their own electrofluorination and they didn't really know what they were making. We got to remember the analytical equipment to detect these compounds wasn't, it was barely invented. So the first max spectrometers were around this time. Um, so they had no idea what they were making. Turns out they were making hundreds of different chemicals um, and they were isolating and purifying chemicals without really knowing what the structure was. And some of these early chemicals they made um, while they were making them, there's a great story. This lab technician, Joan Mullen, she had a beaker of the stuff that Patsy Sherman had made and she spilled it on her tennis shoes. Oh no, she spilled it on her tennis shoes. But what she found, um, after she was, the story say, pretty upset about her ruined tennis shoes, um, they found that her tennis shoes were now waterproof. And this was the kind of eureka moment because 3M had developed this electrofluorination. They had developed the chemicals. Electrofluorination was expensive. They didn't really have anything to do with it. The project was almost shut down at this point. But once they figured out, okay, non-stick, okay, we've got uh, water repellent, we could, we could make some consumer products that could be a big deal now. Um, so this was really the start of 3M going into um, development and then mass production of fluorinated compounds. And during all that, so those years in between, that's DuPont getting up and going with Teflon, 3M getting up and going with Scotchgard. Um, in the 60s, the Department of Defense, there had been some big tragedies where lots of military men had lost their lives in fires. So they created a new mil spec. So this is a new military specification that says fire suppression needs to be better and it needs to meet these, these certain criteria. And when they made this mil spec, um, it was a bit of a challenge to DuPont and 3M and the other companies at the time. They knew it would be foam, they knew it would probably be fluorinated foam, but they had to make one that would meet the specification. Um, by 1965, National Foam introduces a fluoroprotein foam. So the, before the fluorofoams, a lot of them were just protein foams. They used soy protein to make these foams. Um, it was effective, but not that effective. So now, if they add some fluorinated surfactants and that soy protein, they get a very effective foam. 1966, US Navy and 3M together patent fluorocarbon AFFF. That's aqueous film forming foam. That's a mouthful of Fs, especially since it's fluorinated film forming foam. Um, this was a, also a big deal because it saved a lot of lives in the military. This is an excellent um, firefighting tool. It spreads and it prevents vapors and explosive vapors from being emitted from a oil or a gas substance. Um, so this can really put out oil fires. And it was really a game changer in fire suppression. 
and for the next 30 years, AFFF was used for fire suppression, Teflon was manufactured, uh, billions and billions of dollars worth of Teflon sold, and during all of this, 3M especially made a lot of things with PFOS, like Scotchgard, that's PFOS, perfluorooctane octane sulfonate. Um, DuPont used a lot of PFOA, which they referred to as C8 in the production of that Teflon, and this went on. There's a lot of history in between my next jump here um, that involves early, um, early discoveries of the toxicity, early discoveries of levels in people's blood. We're gonna skip that for now. Go straight to the year 2000, Y2K. 3M announces a voluntary phase out of PFOS and PFOA. Notice very closely, they don't say they're phasing out fluorochemicals. They don't say they're phasing out PFAS. That's not a secret. On their website that I've cited here, their stewardship website, they say that they and other comp companies continue to make PFAS, um, but it was PFOS and PFOA, the eight carbon link uh, compounds that they phased out voluntarily. And that was just 3M. Um, DuPont, you know, continued to use the C8. They, they even continued to build new facilities that use C8. And then in 2004, DuPont settled a big class action lawsuit. This is in the movie Dark Waters. Um, this is the big story that they tell. Um, and it was kind of a pivotal moment where everyone said, okay, now this, this is real, this is a big deal. These compounds are a little bit scary. So today, what's going on? PFAS compounds still heavily used worldwide. And most AFFF still contains fluorocarbon-based compounds in it to meet that mil spec. Uh, at any given airport around the country, Air Force Base, Navy Base, installment where there's fire suppression for gas fires, you will find these compounds. Now, the Navy is has phased out the use of fluorinated AFFF, um, but to meet that spec, it's really difficult to do it without fluoros. So what's happened is through all of this and all these years, um, we're kind of still using and still relying on these products. We are still manufacturing them. They're still everywhere. The structures have changed. The properties maybe have changed a little bit, but this is going to be an ongoing problem. We've, we've only just begun. So that's it about the, a quick hit. So that is a quick history of PFAS. Um, again, I hit some main points there. I skipped a lot of important things, but hopefully it was informative. Hopefully you learned something. Um, I hope you can see my links. I'll post them with the video too. If you take a look at them, a lot of them had really good information, some really good timelines, some really good resources. Tune in next time, I think will be for PFAS toxicology or possibly nomenclature, possibly something else. Take care, bye.